I found a dead end. I think I'm lost. Where would you go to the bathroom? Yeah, there certainly is no place for that in here, is there? No, I don't think so. Yeah, I can see everything up here. Mm -hmm. Nothing getting past me. Hi, everyone. My name's Emily Fiebre. I'm also known as Ranger M. I'm an environmental educator and communicator, and I get to talk to a lot of different people about all things nature and conservation. I love to knowledge share, and that's what I want to do with you. So come on, let's go learn with Ranger M. Hi everyone, today we're at the Longwoods Road Conservation Area to see the Scanado Village and Museum. Let's go meet up with Allison, the curator. Hi Allison, what do you do here and can you tell us a bit about yourself? Yeah, so my name is Allison. I am the curator of Scanado, which is a village and museum that's in Longwoods Road Conservation Area, one of our many conservation areas within the Lower Thames Valley Authority. Um, so what I'm responsible for is taking care of the museum, doing education programming, looking after our artifacts, uh, and sharing information about the history of this area with people who come to visit. What do you think we should check out first? Well, right now we're outside some of our largest artifacts, which is our heritage cabins that were donated to us from the three First Nations communities that are right around uh, the Longwoods Road Conservation Area. So that's Oneida of the Thames, Chippewa of the Thames, and Muncie, Delaware. So each one was donated by each one community. And then we also have our longhouses, which I think are pretty neat, which we should really go see. All right, let's go check out the longhouse. Allison, I thought we were going to the longhouse. <laughs> <laughs> well, the longhouse is inside here. Uh, if you want to see it, you're going to have to go through the maze in our palisade, which is what this big fence-like structure is made of cedar poles. So is this a type of fence or what was this structure for? Yeah, so a palisade is, is essentially a fence, you're right. It is used for protection, it helps break the wind uh, to help keep the things inside of the village safe from the weather and the climate. It also helps protect against intruders, so that can be people, but it also can be animals since obviously a thousand years ago when people were living in a village like this, uh, there'd be a lot more wild animals roaming around than what we would normally see today. Awesome, well, I guess it's time to get lost. <laughs> well, I've never been here before, so let's see if we can make it. Then you can just go around the whole thing. How's it going in there? Are you getting good and lost yet? Allison, I found a dead end. I think I'm lost. All right, it's around this way. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> found my way yeah. with help. Oh, wow. Here we are in the Longhouse Village. Here at Scanado, we have three longhouses, two that are complete, and one that's sort of in the midst of construction. My, that one is my personal favorite because it lets you see just how the structure was built, which is really a feat of engineering to think about the fact that they didn't have any modern equipment or ladders and things like that to help them along the way. Our longhouses are definitely shorter than what they would have been in the past as is the palisade it's a little bit sparse in comparison but being in a conservation area we're wanting to make sure that we're making good use of the resources that we are taking from the environment uh, so we're only making examples rather than life size so our longhouse village uh, is a recreation of a village from about a thousand years ago that would have been inhabited by the Haudenosaunee, who are the people of the Longhouse. Uh, and at that time, between the year 800 and 1200 Common Era, there were three different settlements that took place right around Longwoods Road Conservation Area that we actually have archaeological evidence of. And we used that as well as information from local First Nations communities to help us create the village so that when people come to visit, they get a plausible understanding of what life was like a thousand years ago. Can you go inside the longhouses at all? You certainly can. Now, one of the things that people will say right off the bat is, wow, everyone must have been really short back then because the doors are low. That's actually to keep the heat inside because remember, a thousand years ago, no electricity, no indoor heat. Your only source of, uh, well, environmental control is fire. So you're going to want to keep as much heat as possible inside. So you keep your door low since the heat rises and hopefully keep as much warm air inside since it would be pretty cold in the winter. Are we able to go in and check it out? Yeah, we sure should. Let's go take a look. 
Do you know the origin of the word Canada? Do you know the origin of the word Canada? Canada originated from the St. Lawrence Iroquois First Nations word Canada, meaning village or settlement. So this is really neat. Uh, were these like just used as bedrooms or were there different uses for different longhouses? Yeah, so your longhouses were basically your multifunctional space. Because if you can imagine in the winter time, you're not gonna wanna go out anywhere. It is very, very cold. So in the winter months, everyone was in here. So for everyone, that means basically for every fire pit, so we have one here right in front of us, there was two families. So one where we're standing on this side of the aisle and one on the other side of the aisle. So they would generally have about six to eight people in their family. And families were matrilineal. So that, that means is kinship was followed down the woman's side of the family. So now if we think about kinship, we often think about people's last names as an easy way to reflect on that. Whereas a lot of people have the last name of their father. In Haudenosaunee practices, being matrilineal, they were looking to their mother's side of their family to provide an understanding of their relationship with one another. So a longhouse would house people from the same family on the woman's side. So it would be the grandmother, your mother, her sisters, maybe your aunts, or someone who um, is very old from your family, like your great-grandmother, if they were still around, and then all of the children. Once um, folks grew up and gentlemen were thinking about getting married, they would have to look outside of their village and go and find another community to marry into. So they would leave their, their mother's longhouse and then go live with their wife's longhouse. So you pointed out the fire pits here. So all I can think about is smoke going everywhere. Yes. Was that the case? Or? Definitely. And the smoke actually had a lot of purpose as well. So up above us, there are beams that help with the stabilization of the longhouse as well as the creating the frame of it. But you would also hang food up there and use the smoke from your fires to help preserve the food. So you would essentially smoke it since you have the fires anyway, they need to be going to keep you warm and safe and to cook. You might as well preserve your food at the same time. And then you definitely need to worry about ventilation still. So there are holes in the roof uh, so that some smoke can escape as well. Uh, <laughs> question, mm -hmm. where would you go to the bathroom? Yeah, Jeff, um, yeah, there certainly is no place for that in here, is there? <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> a lot of people think about, well, what are people's notions of privacy? They would have had furs and skins hanging to help lend a little bit of that because what I have here behind me, it would be a sleeping area. So this would be the one family sleeping area. And then just down the way would be another family. So they'd have a little bit of partitions, but you're still not going to the washroom in here. Mm -hmm. Going to the washroom would involve leaving the longhouse, going through the maze, <laughs> and out towards where your midden is, which is essentially your garbage dump. So you had to go pretty far away to go to the washroom. So not only in the summer, but in the winter as well. Yikes. So normally you, you waited until as long as you had to probably. <laughs> <laughs> when you were living in your longhouse in the winter time, that's when the most people would be in here. Mm -hmm. Obviously there's no farming to be done. There's not a lot of hunting that you can do. A lot of animals are hibernating or hidden away at that time of the year. So the gentlemen and the men and the, um, the younger adults would all be in the longhouse together and it would be a time for short storytelling, sharing traditions, as well as a time to, to be together since during the rest of the year people would be out working a lot of the time. Women were the farmers, so the Haudenosaunee were actually some of the first farmers in the Great Lakes area, uh, so very important. They grew all kinds of different varieties of corn, beans, and squash, which are the three sisters, as well as a whole bunch of other plants, and uh, would have been making use of the medicines that the land provided them as well from the natural environment. When you say three sisters, I read that means um, that they're, they're really good at growing together. Mm -hmm. um, do you know anything more about that? Yeah, so 
for your three sisters, you would have your corn would be in the center, and you would plant it in a mound because the mound helps uh, you provide stability and prevents runoff so that when you're planting your seeds, they're not washing away. So you would plant a mound. In some areas, like where I'm from up north, you would often put a fish carcass in the bottom of your mound as well to help fertilize it. But you'd have your mound, you plant your corn in the middle, it would start to grow, then you would plant some beans around it, which would then use the corn to grow up as a trellis, essentially. And then around the outside, you would plant squash. So most people would think of pumpkins. And because pumpkins have really large leaves, they provide shade to the corn and the beans, as well as the fact that squash has very prickly leaves and that helps keep all of the rodents away and deters the chipmunks and the squirrels and the raccoons from coming and eating your crops that you've worked so hard to plant. Since if there are say 150 people in your village, it takes about 150 acres of productive agricultural land to feed them all and you don't want to rely on it just in case something happens, so you want to make sure that there's access so that you have enough for two years in case something goes wrong. So that means you probably don't want all of the little critters eating the food that you've planted. Anything else we should know about inside these longhouses? We have our sleeping areas here. Underneath, you would store other types of food in clay pots which you would also use for cooking, since remember, there is no metal at this point, so you are using ceramic uh, and clay pots that you had made to cook your food. You would also have storage overhead for anything that you might have needed to keep what, uh, good or, like I said, preserving your food. Mm -hmm. So making use of all of the space that you can um, so that you're using the space wisely as well as efficiently. So remember, when you're doing all your farming, you don't have any plows, you don't have any <laughs> tractors or combines, you're using probably the scapula of a deer as your hoe and digging it up all by hand. Is there anything else we'd like to go explore outside? Yeah, so we have a whole bunch of different features in the village that we should go take a look at. Uh, there's about 18 of them total, including the longhouses, so lots of different stuff to see. Awesome, let's go check them out. So. This looks beyond my knowledge to build. <laughs> Do you know how they built this at all? So the longhouse was built using cedar poles that would be bent very slowly and then lashed together to form the frame. And not only do we have the traditional knowledge that's been passed down to us about how they were built, but also archeological evidence. So if you are doing an excavation, you would find stains from the posts in the ground that are able to tell you how long a long house was. So obviously you leave it standing, it's eventually gonna rot in the ground and that leaves a dark mark. And you would find those for the posts as well as where your fire pits were. So you have a really great idea of how long and how many people would live in a village based on how many long house um, exteriors you would find or imprints you would find in the ground. What you would do after you have your structure, so you bent your poles, lashed them together, you would obviously lay the bark on. We use a fair bit less bark than they would have used because they would have wanted to make sure that there was no light coming through because it would have added insulation. They also would have added things like moss and fern and different types of plants and um, mosses between the layers to add insulation so that it would stay really warm in here in the winter time once you've had your fires going continuously all that time and have a lot more body heat in here at that time of the year. Do you know how they would, like you have some metal pieces mm -hmm. here and there wasn't metal at the time, so how they would stick together? So they would have used things like gut or sinew from the animals that they were hunting because remember it was very important to use every part of the animal in order to make sure that you are using your environment wisely. So you would um, hunt a deer, he would have the pelt and the fur for clothing, he would get the gut and the sinew to uh, produce 
uh, lashings for things, you would use the meat obviously for food, and then you could use the bones and the antlers for tools. Mm -hmm. So you make use of every part of the animal and then you would also give thanks for to that animal for the, the life that it has offered you and the life that you are going to be sustaining through its, its de passing. Do you know how many longhouses were typically in a village then based on the findings? So or it, at least in this area. Mm -hmm. So it would vary from village to village. Uh, longhouses were generally about 100 feet long. Uh, so very, very long, probably almost as long as our whole village is here, uh, would be just taken up with longhouses. And then you would have had the palisade around the exterior. So much bigger than what we have. Um, but every village was different. So it all depended on the number of people that you had and the number of families, how many longhouses and how uh, long they were and how much space you needed. So it really varied a lot um, from place to place. Do you know which invention was created by the indigenous peoples of North America? The toboggan or snow goggles? Do you know which invention was created by the indigenous peoples of North America? The toboggan or snow goggles? Trick question, both were inventions by the indigenous peoples of North America. Come out this way. We have our mortar and pestles, which are for grinding corn and as well as some stands that would have been used for tanning hides, which you would use the brain and the stomach of the animal to do. So probably not the job that I would have wanted to do <laughs> personally, but it was one of the most important jobs that women would have had in their village since you need to be making all of your clothing and uh, producing um, the hides and making sure that they'll last longer. So that was the best way to do it. This would have been also for preserving your meat. So it would have had a very large fire underneath and you would have laid your meat over top to preserve it using smoke, kind of like they would have done in the longhouse, but this would have been on a much larger scale. Mm -hmm. We also have our corn crib because remember we were planting the, the three sisters, so we have lots of corn. So you would put your corn there to help it dry out so that it would also stay good throughout the winter. So you would have that available to you throughout the year. And we also have a location for folks to be doing work. So we have our little bit of a lean-to to provide some shade because if you're in a middle of a village where you've cut down trees to produce longhouses and a palisade, there is a big open spot uh, in the sun. So you wanted to make sure that you had a little bit of protection there. It gets quite warm. It does get <laughs> very warm. And you would have been using that spot for perhaps um, doing some sewing, making uh, stone or bone tools, any sort of job that you might need space, mm -hmm. as well as might want to be doing it outside of your your home because all of those types of jobs produce a lot of detritus which is essentially just chips of stone everywhere and bone that <laughs> you might not want to step on it probably would on. hurt <laughs> so these are obviously modern stairs <laughs> not what they would have had but safety is first and foremost at the front of our mind for things that we have our visitors using. But we have a recreation of a lookout here that you would have been able to use to make sure that there were no intruders coming up to your village, as well as, in our case, taking a look at what's going on uh, inside the village as well. Yeah, I can see everything up here. Mm -hmm. Nothing getting past me. Do you know the local First Nations to the London area? Do you know the local First Nations to the London area? There's the Chippewas of the Thames First Nation, which is part of the Anishinaabe. There's Oneida Nation of the Thames, part of the Haudenosaunee. And the Muncie Delaware First Nation, part of the Lenni Lenape. Well, thank you so much for showing us the village, Allison. Um, I was just wondering if you tell us a bit about the history of Longwoods and Lower Thames. Lower Thames is just over 50 years old, so, um, been 50 years since the Conservation Authority got its start, but coming up very soon is Scanado's 50th anniversary in 
2023. So we're really looking forward to that and are starting to plan for what we're going to do special to commemorate uh, as well as how we might be able to, to spice things up a little bit in the next <laughs> little while. Hopefully if things keep going positively. Here at the conservation area, uh, we have a couple of accessible trails as well that have been added in the last little while since we're being very conscious of our community. And we also have an arboretum that's really neat that has information about tree species and different types of indigenous life and plants that would have grown in the Carolinian zone, which we are a part of. So I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the history of Longwoods. I heard that there was some archaeological sites here before that you guys created these structures. Yeah, so there are three archaeological sites right around Longwoods Road Conservation Area. The first one is right in our parking lot, so where people get the start of their tour the majority of the time they come to visit, uh, is the Kelly site. There is the Jaworski site, which is a little bit down the road from that in our picnic area. And then across the mill stream in the farmer's field is what's known as the Burke Mattel site. So all very close to here, all about from the years 800 to 1200 common era, so about a thousand years ago. And it was those sites as well as Aboriginal traditional knowledge that we used to create the uh, to create the village that we have here in the recreation. The museum got its start from three gentlemen who were educators and they thought it would be a fantastic idea to uh, share and preserve local indigenous history and heritage with the public and that got all got started in the 1970s. So we're coming up to our 50th anniversary in 2023. I heard there was some significance behind the logo of Scanado. Can you, do you know anything about that as well? Yeah, so our logo was created for us by one of our former staff members. And in it, you will see a couple of versions. There are some with corn, a row of corn husk dolls that is meant to represent community. And then in other versions, we also have the tree of life, which is the white pine in the background. So very symbolic, uh, very um, uh, important symbolism for us as we try to remember the importance of community here. Well, thank you so much again, Allison, for giving us a tour. Uh, it was truly amazing. I'd never been here before, so it was really a great, great learning experience. And thank you for that. Thank you for coming. We really liked having you come and join us. Awesome. Well, thanks for watching, everybody, and I'll see you in nature. Join me for this week's activity by taking a personal pledge of reconciliation. What is reconciliation? Reconciliation is when Indigenous peoples and Canadian settlers come together to repair their relationship over shared understandings. By supporting reconciliation, we are working to overcome the inequality between Indigenous peoples and settlers. That includes poverty, health and living standards, as well as prejudice and racism. You can find a pledge from the Indigenous Corporate Training, Inc. or at the website provided. If you want to learn more, I encourage you to do your own research, but also read through the 94 calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, as well as the 231 calls to action from the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. By taking this step, we are repairing our relationship with Indigenous peoples, as well as learning about our past, the relationship we can have with the land and water, and how we can help our wildlife and ecosystems based on Indigenous teachings.